Well, I was lucky today. And killed a nice salmon for the table. This is a Chinook salmon. It's late August here, and the salmon are in the estuary. They're in the system. You can see in the background, the garden is dying off about the last of the string beans there, the pole beans, and it's the turn of the seasons. September begins this next week, and that's the advent typically of the salmon season. Now, salmon came in early. If we could come in and get a shot here, I could do some talking. Uh, so this is a Chinook salmon. I think it's a female. We'll find out here in a minute. And remarkable, very bright obviously, remarkable, very fresh from the ocean. These are sea lice, it's a type of saltwater parasite, which shows that this is not long out of the saltwater. Caught in the estuary system just this morning. I just got off the water. A friend of mine and I were lucky enough to get out there and get this lovely specimen. Not very big. Hatchery fish. It's been marked. The adipose fin has been clipped so we know that it came from the fish hatchery. Anyway, we're going to cut this salmon up and see where we go. We're going to start with this vent right here. And you saw me sharpening my knife. We're going to run this knife all the way up through the belly carefully. This is where we get the first look. We always like to look at the meat and see. And it's very, very orange. It's just lovely, lovely, lovely. Still a little blood in there. That's no big deal. We did bleed the salmon out. And it is a, it is a male. So it's not a female like I thought. The mouth, typically on a female, smaller. So it wasn't, wasn't big, but it's, it's only probably a three-year-old fish anyway. And we might make a cut this way. Again, anything you're going to do for the table with the knife, be very, very sharp. Cut all the way up to the backbone. All the way down, you want to make that cut. And then start cutting this way. And with a sharper knife, you get closer to the spine, then you get all the meat off that you can. And soon you should be able to punch that through, work that all the way down to the tail, and then peel the fillet off this way. I like to just keep peeling it and this way try to get it as close as possible to the rib cage. Again, I just get to do this a few times a year, so. I'm not a professional. And there's our first nice piece. I'll put that in some clean plastic or glass. And on to the other side. So this fillet might have come out a little bit better. Isn't that lovely? And what's the point of fishing? Well, it's a lot of fun but you feel like you're actually doing something to feed yourself. 
And anytime we can provide our own food for the table, if you could come in on our fillets here, then we feel like we actually have some ownership in our in our own welfare and well-being. So that was a nice morning. And you know the limit here in Oregon is two salmon, so I could have taken two salmon even bigger than this. But sometimes a whole limit of salmon feels almost criminal. I mean, a garbage bag full of fillets is unbelievable. How, how much does one person need? So a really fitting segue, now we're going to talk about the marinade. So we've got the salmon cut up in smaller pieces. And market value for uh, king salmon here is probably upwards of $10, $15 a pound, sometimes more, wild caught. So that's a 10 pound fish, maybe. We cover half of it, five times, this is maybe $50 to $75 in retail. Just what we were able to put on the table for ourselves. Now, we do the marinade and the timing couldn't be better because we have the last, very last, of the lovely apple cider from 2015. And this is from some of the same apples you're going to see later in this segment that are in my orchard, in my front yard. And it's just perfect because it's apple season also. And so we're winding down the garden, moving out, finishing up at the orchard. And this is the last of the ciders in the freezer and it kept. It's beautiful. Mm. So lovely. But we're going to use it, I keep the wasps off the salmon, we're going to use that in the marinade. Now what's the elements of a classic marinade? Salty, spicy, sweet, and sour. We're going to leave the sour out of the equation. Salty, with some nice gluten-free tamari soy sauce. Frank's Red Hot. I just grabbed this stuff out of the kitchen. And the apple is going to provide the sweet, but there's also some complexity there, and there is an acidic tone, and this will help to start that breakdown process, and that's why we marinate for flavor and to begin breaking down the meat. And so I'm real improvisational in everything I do, so I'm just going to put the stuff, and we're going to go into glass now, keep the wasps off here. I'm just going to put the pieces in the glass bowl, and why not? Let's just start with uh, apple cider. That is the last of the 2015 apple cider. And what's so amazing is the amount that was left in the, it's just a food grade plastic container, and this was in the freezer, and it froze beautifully, just not even an airtight lid. Boom! There's a little frost on top of it. When I took it out, scraped it off, it's beautiful. What's amazing is the timing on all this because exactly the amount that was left, and I drank several glasses of it, was just enough to cover the salmon that I brought home today. Amazing. I mean, just you, you couldn't make this stuff up if you tried. So let's put in, again, I'm real improvisational with everything I do in the kitchen because we can always add more. What we can't do is take away. I put too much in, then I can't take the saltiness out. Same with the yellow jackets. Same with the spicy. It's just a red pepper sauce. I think there's a little vinegar in there, maybe a little salt. Turn that over and over the next course of the next couple days before I put this on the grill, which we also might feature, we can turn that over again that is going to go down to the refrigerator and going to sit until we decide to cook it. Signing off for now is good morning's fishing and I'll do the cleanup here and we'll move along. So here we are, it's September, beautiful, beautiful day, September 16th, 2016, and the summer garden is winding down. You've seen plenty of the produce here.
here. This is not exactly the last of it. There's still some carrots and beets in the ground. Um, we could take a tour, but I've done some uh, preliminary digging. We had the beans here, of course. Those are up. Might point out a couple things with uh, lettuce and the beans that we pulled up. But let's go over some of the last of the main harvest of summer. We'll go from there. These are the lovely red and white potatoes. And we will get those in kind of a cold storage for the winter. Red and white onions, this is just part of the onions. Last of the green peppers, the cucumbers. They're quite a bit, probably more than 20 pounds. They're always overproduced. What's left of the tomatoes? And then these are all shallots. So find a way to use and store those. Soon we'll be moving into our fall and winter garden. We do a lot of greens, spinach. We can keep the carrots going, hopefully plant some more, get those sprouted. The kale is uh, thriving. Matter of fact, let's take a little tour. We haven't talked that much about seed saving, but these beans kind of got away from me. And inside each one, though, do a couple things with these. They haven't been harvested. There's probably a pound of dried beans, but we can see inside most most green beans grown in our hemisphere have edible beans or seeds inside. So these can be saved for seeds. They can also be eaten. So I'm a teacher, so I might have my students shell these out and get them ready for planting next year. Uh, these are perfectly ready right now. These are viable, should be viable seeds. I don't. I think this is an open pollinated variety. I don't, I don't think it's a hybrid, so they should come true to form. I left the cilantro in place. The bees, as we've seen before, really like the forage. And they're really buzzing around earlier in the day when it's warm. This will also end up going to seed, and it becomes sort of just volunteer. I had a lot of cilantro. Try to do a better job gathering those seeds for the winter. Beets are still going. Beets and spinach are still going strong. Those will go out th throughout the winter. And I want to show this lettuce here. This has been a really, really beautiful romaine lettuce. And left in the ground too long, though, it will also, it's called bolting, where it's going to seed itself. And these will eventually become little lettuce seeds, and we can save those if we like. The uh, lettuce becomes a little more bitter and I pulled the rest of it. I just wanted to demonstrate that. Carrots are still in play here. So they're still, these are still uh, definitely producing and even getting bigger, even though uh, slower with the declining hours of sun. I went ahead and pulled up, the potatoes came from this area, and I have put the cat guards in place, us urban gardeners. Here come the cats. Kitties like to dig in the soil. Same thing here. This has all been uh, pulled up, and the kale is still very, very productive. The kale is really still, it almost seems to thrive more in the winter. That's kind of the long and short of the last of the summer garden. We have a lot of apples to pick. We're making cider, that's also a big part of this segment. So we're going to move out to the orchard and start picking those Fujis and there's some liberties left. You caught me at a good time again fall in our apple orchard and as busy as summer is fall is even busier because it means cleanup from the summer garden keeping everything organized in the orchard and then it's apple season it's September 2nd here on the southern Oregon coast I feel everything's ripe ahead of time these are the beautiful boss coop apples you can see the russeting and uh, I believe they have like a Cox's Orange Pippin parentage. At any rate, they're big. This tree always seems to produce. And they, 
have been falling off and we've been picking them up and there's some windfall which we can share but really I just want to get them off the tree in this setting I, I think a lot of the apples have maybe been grabbed by neighbors but still if we can back up here there's probably and come up here there's probably at least another 75 or 100 pounds of apples on this tree so we're gonna go about picking them and I started off with the apple picker really in a in an environment like this you can't always get the ladder up where you need it and not having a real orchard ladder not yet anyway resort to the apple picker and you hook the prongs over the stem and just gently pull off there's a piece of foam here and it may be a little safer than crawling up on a ladder so there's a few here that really are easier to get to with the picker and on it goes. This apple's multi-purpose, uh, good for fresh eating or baking, and we're going to use them for cider. We've already got quite a few here, but before I finish with this tree, I think we should talk about the other trees you're going to be picking from right now at this time in early September, because they're the ones that seem to be ripe at this time. So, lay that down. Again, the Belle de Boscoop apple, it's a Dutch apple. I think the parentage is more recent, maybe 60s or 70s. Coming this way. Apple we've talked about before. This is Liberty, and these are definitely ripe. Let me find a good specimen. This looks like kind of a nondescript. There's some waxy bloom on there. Looks like kind of a nondescript smaller apple. They are lovely, almost like candy. And these make really intense cider. So I'll throw a few of these into the mix as well. I'll eventually keep them separate, but I mean, a really good example. It's not hard to tell one from the other. And Liberty so-called because it's free of disease. That's why they call it, and that's a hybrid apple. That's why they call it the Liberty. And then finally, back this way, highlights my need for pruning actually. You can see first of all all the windfall. And when this many apples are falling off the tree then we realize it's time to start picking. Very windy here in the summer and we've got a lot of windfall. This apple might be my favorite one in the orchard and it needs to be propped up and pruned again. But this is the Carmine de Sonneville apple. Not totally free of pests or disease, but this one is really russeted, has a really complex, kind of almost whiny flavor, sour and sweet, and it's a good keeper. And these are gonna be just for the table. So, but one apple at a time so I can keep them straight. And I'm gonna set this one aside. This boss coop is just so, so full that, and it's a very vigorous tree, but often worried that branches are going to break, and I've had that happen before. And they're just, the apples seem to be, most of them just coming right off of there, so they're ripe. Anyway, I got my work cut out for me. Eventually we'll weigh these, and we'll talk about yield. I've eaten a few of them. Some have fallen off, and again, the neighbor kids have picked some. I don't mind as long as they eat them. If they're pulling them off and then throwing them through people's windows, well, throwing them around the street, then I, you know, they went to waste. But if the kids are part of living in a neighborhood and part of the whole urban homesteading thing, is you got to expect there's going to be some loss to the neighbors that's out in the city street. My neighbors are usually really good. A lot of them will ask. And from the garden, I mean, I have so many uh, cucumbers and potatoes and things, I often give food away. 
it's all part of that give and take. In a segment that I hope to do at the community garden, we'll talk to the director and she'll tell us that theft is a real problem over there. Uh, there are a lot of homeless in the area and hey, you know what, if they're going to eat a carrot or something they get out of the garden, I don't mind, but people put their ladder safety again. People put their effort and this is a community garden, effort and time to be growing food within one small plot and then to have somebody come by and take it. It is actually theft and the police are happy to investigate that. Well, this bag's about full already. These apples are big, and they're very sort of... They present themselves very easily to be picked, which they need to be. Let's take a peek here. That is a bag full, and that's 10 minutes less of pick, or, or less of picking. So let's go see what that weighs, and then we'll go from there. Dan Pope for American Peasants. So it looks like that first picking in about 10 minutes is about 20 pounds, give or take a little. And I think the scale weighs a little light, which is fine, just conservatively. I'm going to keep all the apples this year sorted by variety. And so there's a nice box, whoops, of the Boss Coop apples. And you know you could label that if you wanted to. And not, not that I'm gonna mix up the apples, but it's nice to know how much each tree is producing. And conservatively. Uh, look, I would say there's at least probably three more bags like this, so that would make 80 pounds, kind of right in that ballpark. That's been about a 100 pound tree every year, and again, it's produced really well this year. Well, I better get to work, and it's a beautiful day for it. September 2nd here again, and happy growing. Hope things are going well. Signing off for now. So here we are. This is the last of the apples in the orchard for the season. And gosh, you probably picked over 100 pounds so far. You know, it's just a joy to have your own organic fruit orchard. I always dreamed as a kid, as a young man, having enough apples to actually make cider. And that's what we're going to do in this next segment. We picked all of the Boss Coop apples, the Carmine apples, this tree here. Those are all for fresh eating. Those are the lovely, lovely Dutch apple with that uh, Cox's Orange Pippin Parentage. But what's left is the Fuji, and they're typically pretty late ripeners. However, this, and as are the, both the Dutch variety. This year, we had such a warm winter, I don't think we got full dormancy. Everything got pollinated early, and apples don't necessarily ripen in October or middle of October. They ripen after a certain amount of time on the tree. So the, the fruit was pollinated early, and it ripened early, and the Fujis are all Right, so I have to pick the Fuji apples, and this is a variety that's pretty disease resistant. You see these in a lot of shell, but not like this, because these are the organic Fuji apples right off the tree. These mixed with the Dutch, the Boss Coop apples, and some of the Liberties, which I've also shown you. The best cider is, man, this is the third year I've done this. The best cider is made from a variety, and you get that whole complexity of flavor. And you'll see the whole process of grinding the apples, pressing them, and then the final results, that beautiful cider, we can put in the freezer, and then we get a taste of fall in the winter. And matter of fact, I just drank the last gallon just a couple weeks ago. So then we get into preserving the food and all those good things the garden gives us year round. I'm gonna get started. I've got the boxes laid out, pretty simple. The apples, 
come off the tree and in the box. Signing off for now. The next segment will be actually getting the cider press ready and making that cider. Well, greetings. Here again, getting set up for making the apple cider we've been anticipating all season. And if you come around this way, we've got our apple set up, many different varieties. We've got the Fuji's, we've got the Liberty apples, and we've got the heirloom Belle de Boss Coupe, the Dutch apples. And it's through combining the apples we get all that complexity again, so we want all of them on hand. At our cutting board, cut out any, you know, with organic orchardry, you get a few insects here and there. Uh, catch container, just food grade plastic stuff from the restaurant supply house. Here's our apple press, and the apples go in here, very simply, and you'll see this in operation. The apples go in the grinder, the hopper, we spin the heavy cast iron flywheel, the ground up, they fall into the basket with the, it's almost like a cheesecloth, isn't it? It's a nylon bag, and then we move that back and we begin to press out the cider. I'm going to continue setting up here, and I might also mention this is in our, taking place in our school garden, I'm a teacher, and this is our greenhouse, and maybe we'll do a tour later, but it's a beautiful day in September, September 17th, and we're going to get started, we're going to set up and we'll be right back. Well, here we are. We are just about ready to start our pressing process. We've been grinding the apples, and my camera person can step down. We're going to fold over the mesh bag afraid our wasps are permanent residents here. They're very interested in the apple pulp and maybe in the side of... Let's get a shot of this. Even before we start pressing, the cider starts to drip out. Then we bring the tray this way, the whole apparatus, and this is all built on an incline a slight incline to get the flow of the cider from the tray out of the bag into the tray and then there's a spout there. So we find the weight and this makes the pressure on the bag and all the pulp uniform. A little fiddling is required sometimes. And then the big screw goes down and fits into the socket if we want to come in and see. We can always adjust just a little one way or the other. And we start that cranking down. So we crank it down until we, the cider really starts to flow pressing the juice out of that pulp, which is inside the mesh bag, which is also acting as a filter. And we don't want to screw this down too tight because we don't want to break the, uh, we don't want to break the apparatus. So we let that run out. It's running, again, being pressed out, out of the bag. The pulp is uh, being pressed through the bag into the tray, a slight incline, and coming out. It's a very simple process. It was probably old. This process is probably old even in Thomas Jefferson's time. So, purely mechanical analog process. 
cut the bad spots out of the apples. And we, again, made a real nice mixture of the Boss Coop apples, the Fujis, and the Liberty apples to give the cider that complexity. I can see we need to turn our screw down a little farther. And we're not even quite at half a gallon, but we will continue, it will continue to flow. And it's just use your best judgment when you think the apples have been pressed dry. And that process continues until we press all the apples. We'll be back uh, in the next segment with a little discussion about yield and show you how much we've pressed and signing off now for American peasants. Back in a moment. So we're backing off the big screw here because our ciders, our pulp is just about squeezed out. And this press actually belongs to a friend of mine, so I'm not going to, it, you know, 20 years old, I'm not going to put too much stress on it and then we destroy the press. So we replace one container with another to catch any. This is pretty precious, we don't want to. We don't want to, as a matter of fact, it can continue right into there because we'll continue this with the next batch. Or no, second thought. That goes there. My lids. start pressing it, I'll probably dump this into there and continue filling that up. Then we'll switch containers. All, that's all for now, signing off. So, that is, oh, maybe 50 pounds of apples. And we filled up one container of the side we're making the cider down here below if we want to get a shot so even before we start pressing the cider is beginning to flow and we'll get a up close to that and we'll talk about the process so this uh, is a cider press actually and this process is probably old even in Thomas Jefferson's time we fold the bag over there's a almost like a cheesecloth nylon bag. We fold that over with all the pulp. We saw the, the uh, hopper and the grinder working. And we bring the whole apparatus this way, little by little, as we don't want to waste any of our cider, until we can place this round weight, this helps us press out the cider, on the bag and we screw the big screw down we want to make sure one where that, that, that mates up with that recess in that plate trying to get some uniform pressure going and again this is a digital process. This is a very analog process. And make sure we're not losing any cider. And we just screw this down until the cider really starts to flow. We reach kind of a critical mass as it's pressed through the bag into the tray, and this, the tray is set on an incline, so it will run naturally through gravity out of the spout and into your catch container. Now, I'm going to switch these out. We've got a, one of those paper wasps in there. I'm afraid they're 
permanent resident. And cap that off and we continue the process. You might notice when I'm grinding, I'm using the left arm, I'm using the right arm. I tell a quick story about my dad. So he and I were building a fence one time. I said, Dad, you ever think, he was an athlete like me. I said, Dad, you ever think about switching hands with the hammer? And he said, well, why would I want to do that? I said, well, you get balanced work with your left and right arm. He said, I don't care about the phys ed end of it. I just want to get the work done. But for two reasons, stamina, I want to have enough strength to do it and finish the job, but also to uh, balance the work between left and right sides. We'll let this flow, and we'll be back with the next part of the process. Thank you. So it looks like we got most of the cider out of the uh, batch of pulp we were pressing. And I'm backing off the big screw here because we need to basically empty out the bag and then start over. And I'll explain. I uh, end up putting some a cloth. It's actually one of the other pressing bags over the catch base in there because the wasps are getting in there and actually swimming around in there. That's a paper wasp, and we call them yellow jackets, but those are the, these are the kind that actually chew up wood and make their sort of egg-shaped nests out of paper. You can see the holes where they populate those. Anyway, on and on with side, meaningless side information. Slide this out, and this whole bag will end up going over into our compost and we kind of come this way and the raccoons can just knock themselves out. We'll be back We'll be back and start that process over again. I'd probably come back and wrap it up and show, show you all of our yield for today. Anyway, moving swiftly along. Now you've seen the six gallon containers full of the beautiful apple cider again. The Fuji apples and the Belle de Bosque, the Dutch heirloom apples. Quite a bit of work today, about four hours to press that. It's actually closer to five gallons, but we distributed it between the six containers so it wouldn't slosh around in the, in the vehicle getting it back to my refrigerator. This is the cider press made by Jaffrey. I believe it's still built in Kansas. This is at least 25 years old. You know, it's been quite a day. Time to take a break. and. Uh, We'll tune in again very soon with American Peasants.